horrifying uh, cross country drive that I took with my family. And, and there's, a, there's a sort of family story that, that I was in the back of the car reading all the time. And, and my father would say, look, it's the Grand Canyon. And I would go like, oh yeah. And, <laughs> and go back to my book. And it was again out of the desire not to be where I was, to be someplace else. And, and when I was a kid, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, and I thought about it when I was writing, uh, reading like writer too. I really didn't know the difference, and I didn't care about the difference between good books and not so good books, or trashy books and serious books. I mean, I just didn't know, and I didn't know really until I was quite far along, you know, probably in college, I guess. I mean, I didn't know there was a difference between Gone with the Wind and Shakespeare. I just didn't know. You know, all I knew that was that I would read something and I was in a different place. Uh, I was in the world of the book, and that was where I wanted to be, and I was in some place else. And, and you know, again, my parents, um, because they, they, they thought when they were working, I wanted to be there. The long, endless summers when I would stay home, all my friends were going to summer camp, and they went, no, no, you know, we're going to be off during the summer, and we want to be here. So I would pass those summers just reading books one after another, and I, and I remember going to the, I, the local public library, which was the Brooklyn Public Library, I'm, I still feel a kind of pang of joy and pleasure <coughs> when I go to the Grand Army Plaza Library or my branch, which, which was the Linden Boulevard Library. And you know they would let you take out as many books as you want. I would just come home with stacks and stacks of books and just read my way through them. And it was just pure joy. So reading for escape. Then, um, Reading for information, there's that. And, and of course, you know, when you read nonfiction or when you're at school, there's a, a certain kind of information that you read for. But then even, I was thinking about this today, reading not fiction for information. As I said, I teach at Bard College. And, um, and this week, my students are reading uh, a short novel by Roberto Bolaño called By Night in Chile. Maybe some of you are read this, and it's uh, uh, an incredibly beautiful novel, and it's written as a kind of deathbed confession slash rant by a Chilean priest who, um, who among many other things he did, finally worked for Pinochet, the brutal military dictator who um, who ruled Chile for almost twenty years, and and this week it's become clear to me in the course of my students sending me uh, response papers by email, that they don't know who Pinochet was. They have no idea who Pinochet was. And they're reading the book, and, and they, think, they think the book's about art, which it sort of is. And they think it's about um, uh, literary criticism, which it sort of is, and about being a priest, which it sort of is. But, but there are things about the book which they can't understand because they're not, I mean, on the simplest level, they didn't look on Wikipedia to, to see who Pinochet was. So for example, there's a, um, a very beautiful section in the book in which the priest, the hero, the, or protagonist in any case, is approached by two guys who, uh, who turn out to be agents of Opus Dei. And they say to him, um, we have a project for you. And the priest is sort of a poet and an artist. They say, we have a project for which you're specially suited. We want you to go to, um, Italy, to Europe and study the preservation of churches. And uh, so, and the priest who thinks of himself as an artist and as a priest says, this is the perfect project designed for me. So he goes to Europe, and uh, when he gets there, the various priests say to him, well, you know, in the new world from which you come, the problem is car exhaust and pollution. But in the old world, our problem is pigeon droppings. That's mm -hmm. the problem. That's what's uh, destroying our churches. So we have found a particularly unique solution to this problem, which is that all the priests have become falconers. We have falcons, and we have, um, so the falcons go out and kill all the pigeons. And our protagonist, Father Arucha, says, oh, what a great idea. And he goes around from city to city where all these falconers and all these masses of dead pigeons, and, um, and he finds one priest who says, actually, I don't think this is such a good idea. Um, because pigeons are God's creatures as well, and uh, but the, but the, our hero says no, no, it's really a good idea. When he comes back to Chile, the agents of Pinochet say, "This is our guy. 
this is our perfect guy. This is the guy who thinks that killing pigeons is a good idea. So, so all of this information is, is collected in this novel, but because my students don't know who Pinochet is, they have a hard time understanding it. So believe me, in Friday's class, by the end, they will know who Pinochet is, and they will know something else about this book. So, so in that sense, even fiction, or especially fiction, can tell, can give you a kind of historical information and complicated information about, about the past, about history, the recent past, about the way in which history is reflected by and reflects private life as well. So, um, so then, uh, the other thing that, one of the things that I enjoy about reading, why I read, is, is the way in which it gives you a connection with the consciousness of someone, of another person. I mean, someone who may have been dead for hundreds of years. When you read a great novel, when you read a novel by Flaubert or Chekhov or George Eliot or Virginia Woolf, you're, you're intimately connected with the mind of that person, with the mind of that writer, more intimately connected than you might be with someone you actually know, who your neighbor, with someone you're close to, because, because the <coughs> writing comes from such a deep well in the writer, and when you read it, you have that kind of connection. Um, this, I've just been reading, is something I want to recommend to you, the, uh, the journals, and actually earlier, Noreen and I were talking about the joys of open stacks. At, at Bard, they have open stacks, and, and the pleasure is you can just go around and pick some strange book that um, it just seems interesting. So for the last couple of weeks, I've been reading the journals of the Goncourt brothers, who some of you may know, were two brothers who lived in, in Paris in the 1850s, 60s, uh, who were just, they couldn't have been stranger. They lived together from what, from all, from what, what can tell, they were madly in love with each other. Um, they wrote together, one of them gave dictation to the other, but they wrote in the first person singular, I. They knew everyone, they were very close friends of Flaubert, of Daudet, of, of um, Fredo, of everyone who was writing in Paris at the time. They shared mistresses, and they went out every night. So they, and then they came back and wrote about everything they had seen. And they were marvelous writers and really interesting. And then from time to time, they would publish sections of their journals. And, and when the journals would come out, they would lose all their friends because, <laughs> because they were so mean. And, and so they would kind of make all new friends for the uh, next part of the journal. So I just, want, I just, wrote, I just copied down um, uh, a, just one typical selection from the Gunker Brothers journals, which I was reading today uh, to read to you, um, which is sort of typical of, of the kind of way they write. Prayer of my cousin, Villeloy. Prayer. O oh Lord, let my urine be less cloudy. <laughs> let the little flies stop stinging me in the backside. Let me live long enough to make another 100,000 francs. Let the emperor stay in power so my dividends may increase. And let the rise in the Antan coal share shares be maintained. His housekeeper used to read this aloud to him every night, and he would repeat it with his hands clasped together. Grotesque and sinister, isn't it? And yet, fundamentally, what is it but prayer, crude and simple? So the books are just full of things like this. I mean, the first <coughs> entry in the book, the brothers say, it, they, they say, oh, there was a coup in Paris today. Louis Napoleon took control of Paris. Uh, it was so terrible and bloody. But the real problem was that our first novel came out today, and no one paid us any attention because there was a coup. So, um, so, so you read these brothers, or I read these brothers, and I feel closely connected with these two peculiar guys who lived in the 1850s and you know, now have been dead for more than 150 years. I feel that I know them, that I'm spending time with them. So, so that's a great pleasure. Um, 